Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank the organizers to organize a meeting where we can look out of the box. And second, uh, I would like to thank them to give me the chance to express my thoughts on the home ground, which is also uh, uh, very interesting. Today I will talk about beta testing, and it will shortly become obvious why I chose this title. One of the uh, one of uh, issues of this conference is that we are trying to address key obstacles which are reducing, on one hand, the quality of our life. And I, I will talk about disease called diabetes mellitus, definitely changing the life of many people, many hundreds of millions of people on, on this planet. Uh, the disease has been described for many centuries. We have records of it for about, from about 3,000 years ago. Uh, it has been to some extent treated during the last century, but despite that, actually is in epidemic expansion. So we don't control it the way we would want. And of course, because we are missing some critical puzzles in understanding the disease, we are still, as you would put in computer jargon, at the level of beta testing. Which is also appropriate because the, the cells that are mostly involved in the, in the pathophysiology of these diseases are called beta cells. And these beta cells uh, secrete insulin, and insulin is one of the hormones I'm going to talk about today. And beta cells, of course, when they are not working properly, they, we, then we will have the disease we would call diabetes mellitus. So, where, I, where are my suggestions for the innovative ways, ways out of the problem? And one of the first things is that we understand human physiology or systems biology, as you want to call it, outside the context of modern civilization, particularly outside medicine and industry, particularly I mean here pharmaceutical industry, because they called hormones in a wrong way. They declared hormones in the wrong way. If I would try to explain, I will explain you the role of insulin. Uh, I will, it will be different how you would call it if you would be in pharmaceutical industry. In pharmaceutical industry, they would say this is the hormone that lowers your blood glucose. But I would not never say this is the main function of the hormone. Then, of course, we have to understand that our organism is not stupid and helpless, that it cannot fight itself back to some sort of challenge that we may have in a gene or something like this. It can perfectly help itself, and sometimes our intervention, intervention is even worse for the organism than at what it would do on its own. And of course, this would help us understand pathophysiology of the disease, and of course, understand that some concepts, and also the, that were made by some leading researchers, they can be wrong and then we have to revise them, that we have to make a new concept, because we need a concept to actually work on a, on a treatment or on a, on a, on a, on a way how we, how we deal with some person who has such a problem. And sometimes we just simply have to stop avoiding the obvious, because sometimes we, we know the things for many years before, but nobody actually goes into this direction because it's so easy to prescribe insulin or some other drugs and we never really think that something else is also possible. So let us first define what is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is, has the signs we can see here. It's polyuria and polydipsia, so the patient would produce a lot of urine. And because it produces a lot of urine, it has to drink a lot. So this is the first two things. It is not the only kind, diabetes mellitus is not the only kind of diabetes we know. I mean, it's just, uh, um, it has, it is related to hyperglycemia, so it is sweet. The urine is sweet, and therefore we can, uh, um, uh, we, we actually develop this name. We know it for many centuries, we said, and we can also the diagnose it for many centuries because the urine, when it, it becomes sweet, actually it also is the concentration of glucose is so high that we can taste it with our taste buds. And this was diagnostic from, for many years before. 
we can have several forms of diabetes. I will have, we'll, we'll give a very, very, very broad distinction between those two because m many other distinctions will fall into any of those. So it's not, I would not go into really, really systematically, clinically trying to, die, to, to uh, separate them. So we don't have enough beta cells because they've been destructed by autoimmune processes or viral infection, etc. Yeah. So this was somehow uh, forming a class which we call type 1 diabetes mellitus. Yeah. And this is an extreme form. People die if they are not treated with insulin. And the second form would be that, which is most common now, and it's, I think it's, as I will show you with the one the slide, slide, slide just one before last, it's completely unnecessary. We make our bodies too big. And because they are too big, even the compensate, compensatory growth of our beta cells actually cannot compensate the body size, and therefore, uh, uh, basically, we go beyond the maximal insulin production in our body, although we produce a lot of insulin, and then we would have type 2 diabetes mellitus, which is usually associated to obesity, but sometimes some people have small hands and the others have small pancreas, so this is just the genetic predisposition for that. So the person who first made a connection between diabetes mellitus and insulin was Bunting here at the University of Toronto in the 20s uh, like of the last century, where they realized that if they remove pancreas from the animal, this will become diabetic. But if they, if they replace the extract from, from the pancreas, from the pancreas back to the animal, they actually can solve the problem. They can solve the major, the major kind of signs that we see in diabetes, which are polyuria and hyperglycemia. But on one hand, this easy solution was a problem. It is basically, uh, we use insulin to lower blood glucose, and we stop what we call osmotic diuresis. So when we have more than roughly 10 millimolar of glucose in our blood, it will start to leak through our kidneys. It will become in the late state of urine, and it will osmotically take water with it. That's why we will have a lot of urine. But if we use insulin, we will drop glucose, and then because we don't have, we have less glucose, the 10 millimolar in our blood, basically glucose will not appear in the urine, and we will have no osmosis to that. But the solution I will show you later is too simple. It's because the insulin the role is not to control glucose only. It has other which much more important effects in our body. So where, where, where do we get insulin from? We get insulin from pancreas. This is kind of the position of pancreas in our body, which we would call erythroperitoneal. And it's, uh, no, a majority of the gland is exocrine. It produces uh, digestive enzymes that help us digest food. So we chew them, and then it's basically exposed to acid in our stomach. But the ma majority of the absorption can be only done after digestion with digestive enzyme, which would, which would happen in our gastrointestinal tract, in duodenum primarily. And within this gland, we have these blue dots here. I think you, these blue dots we call islets, islets of Langerhans. These are small islands where, where the cells are much different and where most of our insulin is being produced in our body. And this is just one of these islets, and the composition is shown here that majority of the islets in red are represented by beta cells. We have some alpha cells in green and some delta cells, which I'm not going to talk about today, in blue. So, how do we get insulin from these beta cells, from the islets? Normal physiological stimulus is glucose. We eat something, or even if we don't eat something, but this is another detail. The glucose will rise, and it will start producing insulin. And this is typically when I eat something, it has to go through the gastrointestinal tract, and this passage actually will produce a large, large insulin increase. And after a while, uh, when the glucose will go down, also the insulin will, uh, will basically start to decline. So plasma glucose level, which we have to keep about one gram per liter or five millimolar or something like this, is basically set there to control this basic insulin release. And ever, every time when it increases higher than that, it will stimulate insulin release in a higher, to the higher extent. And this will then control, make uh, all the function that we can uh, have in our body from insulin. And of course, because every endocrine system in our body is controlled by the feedback loops, so it has to close, it has to stop someday, sometime. 
Insulin will in fact work back on glucose and will keep it within some certain limits. Okay? So the primary role of insulin is not to reduce blood glucose. It will do it just on a feedback loop. So what is then the primary role of insulin in our body? This is the best thing to do is just to see the condition where we don't have insulin. And this is when, for example, in type 1 diabetic, autoimmune processes will kill beta cells. And so we cannot produce, we don't have cells to produce insulin anymore. And this is the condition we get. This little boy actually was suffering from diabetes for some time already. And his body mass has been wasted completely. He would become, uh, so insulin is anabolic hormone. Insulin is a growth hormone. Together with growth hormone, we can grow. If we don't have insulin, we don't grow. So, and we don't die because of hyperglycemia, of high glucose. We die because we lose important things from our body. And these important molecules are proteins and are fatty acids. You would not believe. In the wild environment, fatty acids were much more cherished than now. We are trying to get f free of them, you know. But in the wild type, wild type environment, we could only survive winter if we, if we had enough fat. So we were not saving on carbohydrates. We were saving on our lipids. So what insulin is doing? Insulin is promoting anabolism. If we don't have insulin, we will go into catabolism, starting to degrade molecules that we really severely need in our body, which are proteins for function and structure, and lipids for, for energy storage. So our body will do a lot to keep this actually uh, uh, anabolism going on. So if we have something like uh, uh, a patient, if we give, give him insulin, he will gain his body weight back and he could live on for many years. Otherwise, this was deadly. If you were diagnosed diabetes in former times, it was like a death sentence. Basically, you died within a year. So I would imagine that to stay anabolic, so it means that you can keep precious proteins and precious lipids in your body, you would also sacrifice you know, increasing glucose in your blood which would then, from the cells that are remaining, increase more insulin release, and of course, this would make, keep your body anabolic, and this particularly is, actually becomes into action when we become insulin resistant. And one of the major causes of insulin resistance definitely is because we don't move enough, and our muscle cells, which are a major user of energy, are not hungry enough to eat them, so we stimulate with glucose and they will take it in, but this is not a normal way to do it. So. We have to keep plasma glucose high enough. We have only one hormone that actually would decrease glucose, but we have five hormonal systems that actually constantly keep our glucose high enough. Otherwise, we have a problem. If glucose falls below, it's not only insulin secretion that is decreased. It is also our conscience. We lose conscience if we don't have enough because our brain cells or nerve cells cannot work if, it, if they cannot oxidize glucose. So, the body will do a lot. So a, lot, a body itself will push towards hyperglycemia. So why, why do we want to gl lower glucose? We, what we have to do to work on is primarily work on insulin sensitivity. But I will talk to that in a minute. Why we have so many misconceptions? You know, if you count the number of papers about diabetes, you will probably exceed 100,000 papers. So anybody entering into this field can be completely lost because he doesn't know where to start. We were at that stage, so maybe 10 years ago. So, and then it was only 50,000 papers published on that. So, you know, it's a huge, huge problem. Majority of experiments so far have been done on isolated cells. In the golden era of reductionism, we always wanted to have the minimal, minimal uh, uh, organism or part of the organism to study and then extrapolate all the knowledge to the whole organism. And of course, this doesn't work. It, these experiments are very, very useful to us now because we can understand certain proteins involved. We can use, we can actually make a list of proteins which can contribute to the insulin release, but of course, they cannot tell us practically anything about the emergent properties that we actually will get when we study cells which are still assembled into a group like that, into an islet, or even when they are innervated. And innervation has been mostly ignored in the studies of the pancreas. This is just an electron micrograph to show you the difference between the one granule of insulin. So this is the crystal of insulin that actually has been released with exocytosis. I will t tell you something about that later on. And this is the synaptic terminal 
of one of these nerves, that actually, neurons that actually enter the, 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 the islet, and these are vesicles that contain acetylcholine, probably parasympathetic neural ending or something like this. So just to see the dimensional difference, you know, the terminal is almost the size of the vesicle, so it just, because it is very difficult to study uh, uh, in, in this sort of intact form. This is just an example of pancreas innervation. You see it's very, uh, this, everything what is green are neural connection. These are ganglia of the vegetative system that we can describe. So just an expansion of that would give you three islets of uh, along hands, and they're all connected to each other and they all need to, to coordinate their action. And we hardly know anything about that from the current research. And this is just an, uh, uh, so, and there's another misconception here. Neuro neuropathy is associated to diabetes. We always think it's a consequence, but we don't have any proof against the fact that it might be even a cause of diabetes because this desynchronization of the, of, the, of, the, of the islets would also be problematic sometimes. So how can insulin be released from our body? I showed you this one already. If I eat something, then the glucose will rise and I will get the insulin release. If I put the same amount of glucose through my veins, so I just inject the glucose into my blood, bloodstream, you will see that the insulin release is much smaller because obviously we have something in our gastrointestinal tracts that help us secrete more insulin. I will not have time to go into details, but it's just another pattern that we can have. And I'll show you this simply because most of the experiments so far have been done on the way that, that we control glucose by injecting into a vein, not that people ate it, okay. So and if, we, if we do this protocol, we can see the distinction between a normal, and I will provoke with the use of normal and healthy here. And that a normal person, that actually have this biphasic insulin response, which is also shown here, and compare it to diabetic person. Diabetic person has too much insulin in the background here. But then when it comes a challenge, so the glucose, it actually will fail to release insulin properly. But even this one is even more important. The knowledge we have for some decades, and we completely ignore it, is that if we have a healthy person, and the healthy person is not necessarily the same as normal person, so this would be an athlete, or the human in the wild type environment, so this paleolithic hunter. So these people actually had to run like a small marathon per day in order to find food or to not become a food. You know, this is, was another problem which we basically, we are not challenged every day today. Okay, so if we challenge, if we would have a paleolithic hunter or a marathon runner and give him the same amount of glucose through, into his veins, you will see that it would release about 20 times less insulin because his muscle cells don't need insulin for glucose to enter because they are simply hungry. And we, what we have to do is just to make our muscle, muscle cells hungry and increase the muscle cells mice, of course. This is, if you don't have muscles uh, because we are so uh, uh, sedentary, then of course this will not work completely. So consensus model of insulin release and I would call it a beta version, so it is not the final, of course, because there are experimental evidence, particularly from our group, that actually show that this is just part of the story. But normally, if you eat glucose as a nutrient, it should give you energy. But beta cell would not use energy to contract or to do anything else. It will use the energy, so ATP, so this energy molecule, to close the channels. So this would be potassium channels. And when you close potassium channels in a normal cell, this would mean that the cell would start losing its polarization. I cannot go into details with this. And this losing the polarization would open another set of channels. And these channels, uh, which are calcium channels in this respect, will actually change calcium concentration within the cell. This is normally kept very low. This is just a profile. This is extracellular space. And then you have a huge drop in calcium concentration. And the, whenever these channels would open, I cannot show you here because it's so tiny change compared to the extracellular space, that basically <clears throat> this, this increase in calcium will then trigger exocytosis. Yeah? And exocytosis means that it, the, the insulin granules are being kicked out of the cells into the bloodstream to do all the actions they have to do. So we know CSI is in different locations in the world, but we also have CSI in Maribor, which means cutting, staining, and imaging in our case, you know. And cutting, staining, and imaging in our case means that basically we have a very, very uh, um, a pre uh, so preparation that resembles what happens in the whole organism 
uh, uh, under the, for example, stress of glucose or a meal or something like this. So we can take a pancreas out of an organism, we can slice it, and we can see islets like a small dots here. You see, they're just a bit different contrast. We can put them into the different solutions, and then as we have a very good microscope in Maribor, we can image whatever is going on in these cells. And we use one uh, dye, which is called Oregon Green Bapta, because it, in our hands it turned to be very useful for what we are doing. So this would be one of such islets. Of course, these cells are all alive. We can keep them alive for many hours, even days, but we don't bother with that because all the experiments, the experimenter actually gets tired sooner than the cells, I would say, okay? So we have a high spatial resolution of indicated loader cells. We, the, this spatial resolution is so high that we know exactly what one cell is. So, because the optical, ra the optical slice is thin, and everything, all the, 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 the light that comes from this, from this region of interest comes from single cell. And I just chose two cells. This one is region of interest one and region of interest two. We can also find non-beta cells. One of them is here. I will show you an experiment. Alpha cell is, does not have to stop working when it has its high glucose. And it will not stop. I will show you on the, on the, on the video. So this is the movie we prepared for you. So we just had a slice with some islets inside. In the islets, we were exposed to what we call a meal, artificial meal. We just increased the, the glucose level from kind of like normal to 12 millimolar and then back to, to six. So what happens? So this is static image, you know, and when you start imaging, there is some spontaneous activity, but when we add 12 glucose, a lot of cells start to activate. You know, they activate, and then when they have this higher intensity of light here, means they have high calcium, and that they secrete insulin out of that. Okay, we can do it again, so maybe for non-trained eye, you know, maybe it's not so easy. So we have some spontaneous activity at the beginning, different spots, the very many different cells, you see, and then when we go to high glucose, the islet activates, and it will produce this increased insulin release Then we can have there. So I got this uh, um, movie from Andras Tozer, who is also in the audience here, and we are making people around the world happy with what we, we see. Okay. <laughs> So, I mean, if we then just take a profile from these two regions of interest that I was sh showing you before, um, uh, you will, we can have some first phase, which has been described before. We can have seven phase. It's very similar to this biphasic insulin discharge that we saw in the in, in, in intravenous uh, glucose stimulation. A non-beta cell would actually produce uh, constant activity, which be very little influenced by the change in glucose. So if you are a bit more careful about the dynamics of changes of calcium in this first region, we realize that the cells can be very differently sensitive to glucose in this, in this first respect. They can lag as, as much as 75 seconds. These two cells actually need almost a minute and a half to actually become activated. So there is something going on in the cell, and they are not necessarily electrically coupled to actually coordinate its action. But then if we go to the second phase, so this would be, we, we had to go faster and our beautiful microscope enables us that, you know. We can go up to 100 hertz imaging, which is quite a lot. And then we can actually still, again, get this high, high spatial resolution image. We can choose region of interest here. We, we can measure distances between them, whatever we want. And if we do the, just this imaging during the second phase, we would see that the, the, the activity here that the cells are much more synchronized. You see there is a calcium wave spreading within, and these cells during this second phase are much more coordinated. So the story that I would like to draw, draw, draw out of it is that uh, we have several phases of this calcium uh, 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 increase in our cells, that some of the parts are not coordinated, some are better coordinated, and we can have several different mechanisms controlling that. And just to, level to see you, to, to, just to show you the speed of propagation of this wave would be about 60 micrometers per second, because this can be a delay that we can see from one side to the other side of the, of the highlight. A bit alternative model of calcium regulation in a beta cell would not include glucose and closure of the channel and opening of the channels only, so meaning that the calcium would come from the inside from the outside, but we can also have another storage of calcium, which has been described in many other systems, particularly muscle, heart muscle, or, or skeletal muscle, and so on, which is another source of calcium to control what's going on in our cytosol. 
So we have extracellular space, and we have intrac intracellular space, and we have sort of like cytosol, so where the vesicles are embedded in, where we have very little glucose. It's like a volley of life, you know. So if we, this calcium here increases, of course, the cell dies. It's not, it's not being controlled anymore. So particularly, this protein here we call ryanodin receptor, uh, uh, it has been described in the past to have some role, but uh, since decades, basically, nothing major has been done on that. But we have something obvious from our uh, former life, you know. There is a syndrome which we call poor sin stress syndrome. It makes, it's a big burden for the, for the uh, pork industry around the world because if you are not careful in controlling who, what kind of pigs you're raising, and then you transport them to the slaughterhouse or something like this, they die during this transport, because they are stressed. I would be stressed too, obviously, yeah? Okay, and this, we found that they have in their skeletal muscles a problem with ryanodin receptors, so this calcium pore that normally controls the contraction of a muscle. And then when they got stressed, this actually gets open, and they, they start to contract, and this huge contraction would, would increase the body temperature, and they would actually go into hypothermia and die, and of course, the meat would be useless. I mean, you cannot dye meat, which, is, which is actually comes from these from this pigs. But we know that this comes from the fact that, the, that these pigs have been selected for the, mass of, for the increase in mass of lean muscles. So they have big, big muscles, you know. But they know that they, if they, they die, if they go to, into the stress. But nobody asks them say, why they have so much of the lean mass. And one of the answers, of course, is that they have too much insulin. Because insulin has the same, uses the same receptor, so insulin secreting cells use the same receptors to control plasma glucose in those cells. And of course, uh, um, this constant leakage of calcium will produce more insulin, and as we said, it's, it's anabolic hormone. So it will keep the body growing better than if we don't have insulin. And to finish with, uh, with this story and just starting to see the obvious is that you know, this has been a recent study which has been based on the unfortunate events that happened on the Balkan concentration camps during the last wars. When people with type 2 diabetes were really worried about their survivals within the camps, but most of them actually got cured just because they did not get food. And this is a study which was based likely on, on this experience where they had people with type 2 diabetes, and they feed them 600 kilocalories per day, which means for a 100 kilo person, this would be a quarter of what they would normally eat. And then within a week, their plasma glucose actually went normal. And then, basically, type 2 diabetes uh, problems, in majority of cases, actually are solvable, are reversible by reducing diet dietary energy intake or, on the other hand, which is a bit more difficult with, with older patients with diabetes, is that you con consume more calories. It's a very simple mathematics when you feed. You know how many calories you need per day to survive, and then you either burn the excess or you just don't put in the excess. That's, that's, the, problem. that's the major issue. And I think we have to take into this to account. I think we are over the time where we could actually treat anybody with anything just because it was too easy. Yeah? Putting insulin is very, very, very easy thing nowadays, but I would say it's very expensive, and not, there are not so many people in, in our society that know how much a co is, is, a, is a real direct cost of treating a diabetic person. So this work cannot be done without people who are motivated and excellent in the lab. So we do, did a preparation starting still in Germany with Max Planck Society. So with Stefan, who, who first was able to make the, the slice preparation, Tobias expanded it to, to rat preparation and also shipping young. And then from CSI group in, in Maribor, we have Masha, Jure, and of course Andras, who I mentioned before. And I thank you for your attention.